little of this and a little of that. Like I spend time with our offensive staff watching film of our own team, of our opponents, you know, working through self-scout reports and opponent press. this week's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Matthew Edwards. Matt is the Director of Football Analytics at the University of Virginia, a school that I happen to be an alumni of, and football and math have always been a huge part of his life. While at BYU, Matt majored in math and has a master's degree in public administration. He also played tight end on the football team there from 2008 to 2011. After a few years coaching, he transitioned to analytics in his current role with UVA. He's also started the Master's of Data Science degree at UVA this semester, and he's excited to learn more about the broader field of data science. He's married to Mary Beth Edwards and has two boys, Luke and Shay, who are already starting to get interested in college football, or at very least, the team mascots. In this interview, we learn how Matt made his way into analytics from being a player and the coaching route, and we also talk at length about how someone can break into the sports analytics career. Finally, we touch on why he decided to go back for his master's in data science at UVA. I really hope you enjoy the show. Matt, thank you so much for coming in today and chatting with me. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, you're the director of football analytics at the University of Virginia, my alma mater. So I'm really excited to see that they're uh, embracing analytics in, in pursuit of college football dominance. Uh, I also think you have a really cool story of, of how you broke into this field. And you're pursuing your master's in data science at the, that very same university that I went to. So a lot to talk about today. And again, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much. Excited to be here. Awesome. So the first thing I, I introduce and, and ask almost every guest is, how did you first get interested in the sports analytics domain, in the data science domain? And you know, do you have like one vivid memory or is it just kind of a slow transition where it all made sense when you were making it uh, into that role? Yeah. So I think, I mean, it started when I was like six or seven years old. Um, I mean, I was like a, I would say like a, a pretty smart kid growing up. And at one point it was either my first or second grade teacher told my parents that they should get me a, a newspaper as something to like read and get distracted with. Uh, so I always gravitated toward the sports section and would eventually gravitate to the stats page. So there was always a page that had, you know, the standings for the NBA and NFL and, you know, stats and who was leading the league and points and rebounds and whatever. And I just would devour that every, every time I would read it. And um, at that point, just knew like math was my thing academically. Um, so I ended up, you know, majoring in math and, you know, had a, a good experience and, and kind of had always that kind of mathematical, logical brain um, and, you know, loved sports and knew I wanted to have a job in sports and initially thought I was going to get into coaching. So I uh, was took a coaching job at a division three school coaching football and had a really good experience there and was able to have an opportunity to interview for an analyst position at UVA here. And at the time I thought, you know what, I have a kind of love for math and stats and a little bit of background. I, I had to take a few stats classes as part of my major and my master's and, and took a sports analytics class um, after I finished my master's. And so I had a, a little bit of a background and, and pitched that to Coach Mendenhall here is a, you know, we have this analyst role and I think we should Sorry. give it a uh, analytics focus. And he thought it was a really good idea. And so have been doing that now for the past couple of years. And it was really to me, kind of a, a slow transition of, I have these two things that I really love. I love math, stats. I love like that academic side and I love sports. And so, you know, kind of been a winding road of being able to find a way to combine those two things into what I do now. That's awesome. And so, you know, something that, that, that I know about you from our previous conversation is you actually 
played football in college, correct? Yeah, I, I played tight end at BYU. Awesome. And what, you know, was there any math that intersected with your football experience then, or is that something that you developed the appreciation for more after the fact? Cause I know like, for example, when I was playing golf, um, when I first started or when I was playing very, very competitively, I was like, I know what I'm doing. I'm practicing. Like, I don't have to care about the numbers. And then there was a stage <laughs> where I was like, Oh, like, this makes sense to help me. And, and, it, and it, it came probably a little, uh, a little later than I wish it had. <laughs> yeah. I would say similar to you, like when I played, it was, I know I need to get bigger and stronger and faster. And um, you know, it's, it's helpful to know a few of our opponent tendencies, but not really anything that crazy. Uh, and I mentioned that I, I took a sports analytics class. So I actually took it two semesters in a row. And this was after I'd finished playing, after I'd finished a master's degree. And at that point, you know, I, I did a few projects there. I, I think I had to do a project for each semester. One of them was the effect of offensive line play. And then the other was a, an, a like play calling effect study of our data at BYU. And really at that point did I say, okay, this is something that I could really see having a big effect on game day. Whereas when I was playing it, you know, I just, I was majoring in math and slogging through some upper level math classes and thinking there's no point to any of this football, anything, let's just get done with it. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I, I think the, the, the coaching transition is also a very interesting one. I'm always fascinated with kind of pivot points in people's careers. Like you go from playing to eventually coaching. Was there even, was there analytics involved there after you'd taken those courses? Were you starting to try and figure that out? Because I know a lot of the time you're trying to think like, okay, like I know we have to do these things specifically to win football games or, or to win in any sport. And there are more important things to start with. We have to get our fundamentals down before we can integrate some of the analytics. Did you feel like, like, oh my goodness, we're kind of gasping for air. We, we don't have resources or time to put into these things. And is there a right time? Or do you think that maybe you should just integrate these things to begin with? Cause it makes things uh, a little bit easier later on when you're trying to communicate uh, data or any of, or any insights. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if you can integrate it as early as possible, definitely that would make sense um, to me. No, I just, you know, I, even when I was at BYU playing, I, I wasn't entirely sure, you know, I really had two thoughts. I either wanted to be, a doctor like my dad, he's an orthopedic surgeon. And I thought that would be awesome. Um, or a football coach like my grandpa was, and those were really my two thoughts. And when I was playing, I thought I just love football too much. I can't get away from it. So kind of stopped doing the, the med school prereqs and moved towards football. And at that point it was just coaching. So even when I took my sports analytics class, I just thought this is a fun way to be involved with sports um, academically. But, you know, once I got my first, you know, full-time job coaching, you know, I, I didn't really have that analytic focus as I was doing it. It was more just, all right, now I'm fully into my career of coaching and we're going to see what happens here. So I, I definitely did not, have that same mindset of, Hey, I, I learned this great skill that would help me as a coach, just kind of kicked it to the curb a little bit. So well, sadly, no, I, I think that that's a important part of the process. I really think it's, it's interesting to hear how you integrated a lot of the things that you were interested in and you did have to make hard decisions on that path, but it seems like you, you genuinely did follow your interests and you found different ways to integrate your skill set and to essentially ask for what you wanted. I mean, you'd mentioned that uh, you, you spoke to Coach Mendenhall and, and said, I think that this role should be designed like this because it would create the most value for an organization. A lot of people don't realize that in the positions they have, in the situations they have, you know, you can ask for things. You, you can say that you, you have feedback in your company or whatever it might be. And people who, who you're working for, they want you to be happy. They want the most success for their organization. And they'll usually give you a little more leeway than you think. You know, if it's a good working relationship, they're going to listen to your opinion 
pretty seriously. I think that might be a, a broader lesson here is that, um, you know, ask for what you want, follow what you want, and it never hurts to chase a little bit. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there's a little bit of nervousness or fear. One, just to ask for like a raise, but I'd say that's like a very normal thing to do in a job like, hey, I should be paid more than I am. But to ask for, I am doing this currently, but I think my skills or my role would be better here. I would be more, either more involved, more invested, help the company or program or team more. Um, but yeah, I definitely have seen that have a, a big impact in my career because a lot of it, you know, the, the role of director of football analytics is not common for college football teams. Um, and so just even the, the job itself has been really only possible because I went to coach Mendenhall and said, Hey, like you said, I think that this is what we should do with this role. And, you know, not just saying, Hey, this would be cool. Do you think it would work? You know, going with, this is what I think the role should be. This is how I will affect the program. This is what I want to do and, you know, have it thought out and planned. And, and then, yeah, you're more likely for the, whoever to say, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Let's kind of go with it and see what happens. I love that. And so maybe shifting gears just a little bit, what is a day in the life look like? I mean, I would imagine you're still, since, as you mentioned, there's very few case studies of other universities that have similar roles. How are you building this out? What do you hope to achieve? What are some of the main kind of things that you're focusing on uh, in that position? Yeah, so I think that it's been a, an interesting transition as I've kind of grown and seen what, what I can do personally, like what my value and my skills are. Um, initially, it was very much data collection, organizing data, and giving coaches some pretty like basic information that I thought would help them with decisions. Um, and as I've grown in my role, I've noticed that I felt like I needed a like heavier science stats, data science background. Um, and actually made the decision to go back to school, like you mentioned. And so I'm getting a master's of data science here at UVA because I realized, you know, I, I was able to kind of do a base level job at what I was doing. But if I wanted to improve myself and therefore improve our program, I felt like I needed to have kind of a heavier training in either stats or, or data science. Um, and so as I've kind of grown, I've seen that I could, you know, have a bigger impact if I had a more, I don't know if hard science is the right term, but kind of a, a more, yeah, hard science type background. Um, cause there's to answer your kind of like day to day, you know, I do a little of this and a little of that. Like I spend time with our offensive staff watching film of our own team of our opponents, you know, working through self scout reports and opponent prep, you know, especially during the season, I, I spend a lot of time doing that throughout the week. Um, and then, you know, spend time getting other reports ready. You know, we built like a, a website this year with me and a few of our student interns that I have. Um, and so, you know, kind of that day to day, just getting stuff ready for the coaches as they're, you know, making those decisions. And then now that we're in the off season, I have more time to experiment, explore, you know, build kind of tinker with different models and different data that I'm working with um, while also doing a little bit of time with the offensive staff as we look at our past season you know, getting them information about where we were successful, things that we can work on, um, you know, spend a little bit of time in recruiting both, you know, actually talking to recruits, but then also working through different, you know, recruiting models and things that I can get for our recruiting team to help them, you know, make better decisions as well. Awesome. Well, you know, I, I what I think is really cool about your experience here is you're able to kind of grow with that role. Inevitably, organizations, when they're starting to build out their data analytics, data science capabilities, they have to walk before they can run. 
you have to organize the data. You have to have some infrastructure before you can really do anything advanced. And it almost always starts with descriptive, descriptive statistics, dashboards, facilitating decision-making, not making any decisions, right? And you know, it seems like that's kind of the stage you're at now is where you're able to do those things very well, but you want to go back and learn and expand on some of your skills for you know, building models that might make a clear cut recommendation rather than helping that decision making. And it's really cool to me that you can learn those skills and grow in this role and build those capabilities at the same time. Because I think so many organizations do it the opposite where they try to build some system that's far too advanced and they don't have any of the infrastructure set up and they fail pretty miserably. <laughs> so yeah. It, oh yeah. I, I think that it's like a really good thing in this scenario that you can grow with this position. And as you learn more, um, that's a great story to tell to the organization, to the staff, because you're inevitably going to face some of the growing pains that the organization would face. And because you got to deal with them first, you'll be able to be better equipped to understand how the organization will deal with them. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think that anybody that gets a job or is in a new role, they want to say, look at all of these awesome things that I can do. But like the number one thing is not the information that you necessarily present or models that you build, but the things that get adapted and become a part of teams, whether it's in the decision-making process or whatever. So at times, yeah, for me, it's frustrating of, hey, I have this information that I think would be super beneficial. We would really benefit greatly from doing this and it doesn't necessarily get adopted. Now that's a great opportunity for me to look back and say, all right, why was that? You know, is it my skills of communication aren't great? Is it my, you know, actual skill? Is this actually not a good model? And someone from the outside can see that. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, building as you go is a, a really kind of interesting concept. I think that there's another kind of cool parallel there, which is that people think when they get a position, they have to come in and the first day be um, ready to go. They have to know all of data science. They have to like reach some magical threshold where uh, on the first day of the job, they can do everything. And that is <laughs> literally never the case. You come in and the organization expects you to learn quite a bit. You're gonna have to learn how they do business, the business model, the culture. You're also gonna have to learn some of the specific tools they might be using, which can be really important. And so, you know, for anyone watching, I think it's really important to note that like the, the job doesn't, you know, it doesn't end at the interview. It's, it starts after you get the job in the interview uh, and the interview is over. And uh, I think, you know, in data science, there's a reasonable amount of job dissatisfaction. And that could point to, to one of the, the, the small reasons why that might be the case is because, you know, you do the interview process in, in any of these roles it's such a pain in the butt. And then you get in and you're like, well, oh, I got to start again, basically from zero. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I, I think that's an interesting thought as well. Yeah. Well, again, shifting gears just a little bit, and I guess we're kind of on the point of the job and the interview. How would you recommend someone uh, break into a sports analytics role or, you know, how, uh, as, as, I've also experienced it is a tough field to crack into. You know, do you have any any best tips? Do you have to have played college football like yourself, or are there other avenues uh, into getting in? Uh, so I think I mean my role is is probably not the path that a lot of people are going to take. And so uh, what I would say is I I deal with a lot of students. You know, being working at a college that makes sense, right? So I have interns that I work with. I have a lot of students who reach out to me on Twitter and, and other social media. And my advice is always to just reach out because a lot of programs, you know, may not necessarily know what they don't have, um, which is sad. I, you know, I would hope that there are programs out there that are like, man, we could really use some 
person or a team that's dedicated to, you know, analytics or sports science or data science or whatever your, you know, term is that you're going to use. But I, I don't think that's that common yet. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've had students that I've told, hey, just reach out to coaches um, and they've had success and have written back like, hey, now I'm going to be able to start doing work with um, you know, there's a student who was at Maryland that was like, hey, what do you suggest? And I said, just if you are working with lacrosse data already, you've built something, send that to your coach, say, this is something that I've actually built and I've done and I think it would be beneficial. So I think that's, a, you know, not just reaching out because that's good, but then having something that you can show to say, this is, you know, I think it would be important again, kind of like what I was saying that I did with Coach Mendenhall, I had a specific, I think that this is something that I could do that would be beneficial. And then, you know, having an opportunity to, to do it. Um, also putting work out in the public domain, I think is another really good way. Um, you know, I know a little bit about people that have gotten jobs in, in the NFL or NBA, uh, but it seems like there's a really good percentage. I don't have a, you know, exact number, but of people who have just said, I'm going to work on publicly available data. I'm going to build models or visualizations or tools and put them out publicly. And then teams can see that and say, man, I really like what that person is doing. You know, let's, you know, find a way to either interview them or hire them in a consulting role or, you know, you know, whatever it turns out to be, but um, you know, just working on publicly available data, putting it out for people to see, and then just the, you know, kind of tried and true, you know, cold call or whatever it is, email, reaching out to, to people that are making those decisions. Um, Cause yeah, it's, it's a tricky field. And, and a lot of times it's not, Hey, we have this opening apply for it. And then we'll see what happens. You have to kind of go in and say, Hey, I can do this for your team. You should create a position. Um, and at times that can, that can definitely be scary. And so if that's too scary, then just put your stuff out there publicly so that it can be seen. It helps as you're, you know, working through your different skills and stuff, but also can help just get data and what you're doing out there for people to see. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't have said any of those things better myself. Um, you know, I, I think a, a common theme here is that, you know, just like you kind of advocated for yourself in your role, you know, there are opportunities, especially for college students with your sports team. I mean, if I really liked soccer, like who, who's going to turn down? I mean, some people will, but, but if you're, <laughs> if you're putting yourself in, in the coach's shoes, if, if a kid is coming and they're providing you valuable insight essentially for free, it's worth considering. You know, if someone, uh, you know, with some of the, the sports teams that I work with, if someone sends them an email with research they've done that could potentially help the team and it's well formatted, it's, it's you know, professional, they'll give it a look. They'll probably communicate with that person, even if this person is the director of analytics at, at here or there. Um, you know, you, you can create value. And if you're doing these projects, if you're putting them out there, you never know what could happen. You know, I mean, obviously it helps to, to apply directly, but um, it's again, another case of, if you don't ask, you'll never know. It, it almost never hurts to ask a question <laughs> in these scenarios. Um, yeah, agreed. And I can't stress enough for, for kids in college. Uh, if you are at a university with any sports teams, like explore those options, talk to the coaches, talk, you know, find someone in, in the, in the staff and the department, um, you know, just doing some work at the early level creates unbelievable uh, amounts of opportunities, the further you go. Cause I've found that sports there's, it's kind of like an in group and an out group. If you're working in it, there are a ton of opportunities that present themselves across different organizations, whatever it is. But if you're, you're outside, if you haven't made that in, even if it's just working for free or being able to say something on your resume, it is significantly more difficult. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And like you said, any student that hears this or watches this or whatever, 
reach out to the sports teams. Um, there are just so many opportunities. You know, we have done a pretty good job here because I am in this role of building opportunities throughout the sports teams. Um, you know, we had internships with football specifically this year, but, you know, we've just started, you know, overall athletic department internships. And so I, I think, you know, we have these things that we are building from the athletic side, but even like you mentioned, things that are not as formal um, can still be hugely valuable, have a huge impact. That's awesome. And so you, you, you'd mentioned that you would also hired a couple uh, interns fairly recently, correct? Yeah. What are you generally looking for in those interns? So I have had the opportunity to work with students on a varial, or a various types of opportunities. So I've had students who have been working on capstone projects that I've helped kind of oversee and kind of mediate as, as they're working through that. Um, I've had students who have taken a readings course where basically they meet with a stats professor once or twice a week or once a week or every other week and then meet with me and, and they're getting class credit for it. Um, so I've had various opportunities in the past to work with students. And so I wanted to create a kind of more formalized role on the athletic department side so that I'd have a little bit more influence isn't the right word, but like interaction and kind of direction in what they were doing. Um, Cause in the past it's been a lot of their, Hey, I'm doing this academically while also finding a way for that to fit in with football. Um, and so I, I looked at what I wanted to build. And for me, um, you know, I had a pretty specific set of what I was looking for. Um, you know, it helped if they had done work in football before. So whether, uh, you know, it was for a team specifically or just worked with football data, um, that was a benefit. Somebody that had had experience coding um, and then also people that were able to show that they were, you know, committed and, and dedicated to working hard. Um, you know, I had one of the interns that I had this last year was actually a student that I'd had before he was working, he was doing the readings class, um, and he had done a great job as part of that. And so I, I, you know, had sort of thought that he would be someone that I would want to hire in that internship role. Um, so I think going forward, it's going to be more of an, an open opportunity, but those, you know, a little bit of proof, like you're saying that you have done something um, in football specifically for my role, um, you know, the ability to communicate is huge. So not just, Hey, I, I can work really well in R or Python or whatever you're doing, but also the ability to communicate what you're doing, whether it's through visualizations or, you know, reports that you've, um, written up. Um, cause that's a, that's a huge aspect as well. I, I couldn't agree more with that last statement. I, I find that very interesting in my work as well is that, you know, our clients are not necessarily analytics people, right? You know, they're athletes, they're coaches and athletes and coaches are exceptional at what they do, but they haven't necessarily like focused on learning how to interpret a graph, right? Like that isn't yeah. what their job entails. And so you have to be really thoughtful about how you communicate information because one, you might, you know, they might misinterpret something um, from how it's presented visually or how it's said. I mean, like, like a type one or type two error, right? In statistics, some of the worst named things of all time. I couldn't tell you off the top <laughs> of my head what the differences are, right? And so it's yeah. like, well, we have to use like a, a completely different lexicon when communicating that matches up with who our customer base is or who our clients are. And uh, to me, that's something that it, it takes like some natural inclination to it, like being able to speak the language of sports, but also quite a bit of practice because even I, that's not something even I've perfected in any way, shape or form. <laughs> yeah, I think what you're saying, like that there's not, not everybody's used to looking at charts and stuff. I remember one time I would, early on, I had gotten this 
like a bunch of data together and I put it in an Excel sheet that I was like, all right, I know a coach can open Excel and this data looks great. It's really easy to understand. And I sent it off. And then, you know, a couple hours later, I got an email and it just said back, like, what am I looking at here? And I was like, what do you mean? What are you looking at? That's data. It's really well formatted. Uh, and then now, you know, looking back with a little bit more experience, I thought, well, of course, it's just a Excel sheet with, you know, 20 columns and 200 rows. Like, it just means nothing to them. Um, and so it's been a, a, an adjustment for me as I've said, all right, now, you know, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of, you know, how a coach or a player would talk or think because of my background specifically coming from, you know, I did play, I did coach. And so I do have that background knowledge a little bit. And so being able to utilize that as part of data is a, has been a big adjustment for sure. Yeah. I mean, something we started doing is rather than sending reports, we present everything because, you know, there's that gap of interpretation that you can help shape. And uh, I mean, that is, that has been a pretty big game changer for us in, in how we communicate with our clients, because, you know, sometimes we'll send something to us. It makes sense, but from a, like a, a, a different mindset, you know, you, you make assumptions or whatever that might, it might be that are not necessarily yeah. true. Right. I mean, for example, someone might think that um, if, if we give a 90% confidence that events going to happen to most people, they're like, Oh, that's going to happen. Right. But to, to, to people who are in statistics, data science, we know there's that 10% that, that, oh, yeah. that, that is, a, a, it is a legitimate possibility. So um, th that, was, that was incredible. I would like to get just a little bit of your shake on the difference between working at the college level and working at the professional level. So I don't have too much experience working at the college level aside from uh, one of the the models I built, but it wasn't interfacing with any of the the coaching staffs, right? It was working for an organization uh, that that did all of that for me. Um, I, I would love to hear your take on what it what the difference between the the game at at those two levels is, and maybe from like an analytics perspective, how developed the uh, the teams are there. Uh, so I think in my role specifically it is it's fairly unique in that i work you know i played at byu for coach mendenhall here so he was my head coach for four years when i played you know my the offensive coordinator here was my position coach and offensive coordinator and i was a graduate assistant there under the you know most of the offensive staff and under coach mendenhall and now have worked for him for four years and so there is a very established level of comfort in who I am and what I can add to the program to where there is, I would say there's very little structure um, hierarchy as far as I can come up with data and information and, and pass it on to kind of whoever, whenever I think it's going to be beneficial. Um, I feel like at the professional level, it's probably quite a bit more organized and established of this is you this is what you are doing you report to this person who then reports to the general manager who sends it to the coach or whatever that hierarchy is um, and I think there is a little bit more fluidity in college uh, at the same time I think that the ability to <laughs> kind of like draw in other talent, like we mentioned, you know, student internships or students who are interested, um, you know, it's a little bit different than at the professional level. Um, plus it's just not as established. I mean, I think every, you know, it's, it's pretty well established that every NBA team has an analytics department. You know, every NFL team has at least one, usually many people that are working in analytics um, at college. It's, it's, You have people working in analytics. And so there's a little bit, like I mentioned with fluidity, it's, it's a little bit of just establishing baselines and norms as you're going of this is, this is what 
analytics can do for our program. This is what, you know, it is going to do. And, you know, I think it's a little bit more strict. And like you mentioned, you have a little bit more experience at the, the professional level. So you could probably touch on that a little bit more, but that's a little bit more of what my understanding is. I, I agree with you. And, you know, honestly, I didn't think of it in the, uh, in the organizational structure way before. That's a really cool insight you have there. Um, and that is like a really good force working for you, right? Is that uh, in a flatter organization, people are a bit more uh, open to adoption, right? With, with a lot of uh, professional organizations, you have to go through layers and layers of, of I, I won't quite say it's bureaucracy, but you do have to go through these different layers to get analytics approval. And then you have to go through different channels for buy-in. And, you know, frankly, money is at stake even more so in like a different way, where in a sense, like, absolutely, there is money tied to performance in, in college sports. But I also, yeah, I think probably at the professional level, that's even a little bit more front of mind. And oh, so, right. yeah, totally. So it's very difficult to make a change if you feel like it might hurt you for a year or two, because it's very much like, you know, we're, we're, we're going to give this a little bit of time frame, and, and that's not how analytics work right? Like data science, these things, we create a lot of small advantages over a long period of time that eventually creates a big advantage. But a coaching change, for example, that can quote unquote change a program overnight or, or so administrators or, or presidents of operations think, right? And so um, it's, it's that weird dichotomy with these forces fighting against each other. Um, you know, at the, at the professional level, there's a lot better data um, there's probably more financial resources that teams are willing to put behind. Um, but it, you know, I, I really like what I'm hearing about what you guys are doing at the program there, because it seems like being a, a flat organization, having student help, having flexibility and in, in controlling where an analytics program grows, goes and, and integrates with things is, is a, is a recipe for like ignition, right? Uh, for, for fast growth. Whereas I don't think that there's fast analytic growth in many uh, professional organizations at all because of that weird winding structure you have to go to, to get to the top. Yeah, that's interesting. Awesome. And so the, the last thing I wanted to end on is a little bit more with your decision to go back and get your, uh, your master's in data science from Virginia. Um, I'd like to learn just a couple of things. So the, the first is what skills did you feel like that would help you build out? Uh, the second thing is, you know, was that, is that, are they subsidizing you at all for that? I think cost is a big thing that a lot of people constantly ask me about these programs. If you're comfortable yeah. sharing that, of course. Uh, okay. So first a little bit more about my like path to education um, I, I had been thinking about it for a little bit and was really kind of going back and forth between a master's in statistics or data science. Um, you know, I, I didn't know which would be the correct thing for what I you know, might want to do. And I'd reached out to some professionals in the industry and had gotten kind of mixed results. You know, some said data science, some said stats, and some said doesn't matter, get whatever, it's going to be beneficial. Um, but I, I thought that I would want kind of a broad uh, educational experience, no matter what I did. Um, and that's one thing that I like about the UVA program is that it is, it has classes from both statistics and, you know, data science. So like I'm in my first semester right now, I have a higher upper level stats class and an upper level computer science class. And I think that this program was a great opportunity to kind of, you know, maybe get a little bit of both, right? I'd get some higher level statistics training. Also, you know, sign up the logic programming data science training as well. Um, so that was important for me was to kind of get a broad educational um, experience, if that was possible. Um, you know, it, it helps that it's at UVA, which is a, a great university. Um, go Hoos, 
uh, wow. and an opportunity <laughs> uh, to work to do it, you know, like close to, to where I am, you know, it's, it's online. So it's not like I would have to go anywhere anyway, but, but um, you know, to be able to do it at UVA and, and I think hopefully build connections with people to continue to bolster the, you know, analytics program here at UVA, whether through football or through the athletic department as a whole. Um, one thing is, yeah, that UVA was more expensive than some of the other programs that I looked into. Um, you know, I think like I had looked at and applied at the university of Texas where it was, I think it was 10 grand for the whole program. And I was like, man, that would be awesome. Like that's definitely, you know, doable. Um, you know, UVA is more expensive. Um, I do, there's like a, you know, employee, um, I don't know what the right word tuition assistance, I think is the word that they use. Um, you know, I'm not being subsidized by the football team or the athletic department. I, I, you know, it'd be awesome if they, if it was, uh, <coughs> Coach yeah, there is, <laughs> I'm going to make sure he sees this video. <laughs> Send it on to Carla, Coach Mendenhall. We'll get everyone, all the higher ups. Uh, but there is some amount of, you know, I do get tuition assistance to help with that. Because um, that is definitely, a, like you mentioned, that's a big aspect of, of the decision as well. Um, so. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, that that's something I always, uh, you know, am very conscious of. You know, I didn't look for scholarships or grants as much as I should have for my graduate education. Um, and they're hundred percent were ones available and just taking some time. If you are going to pursue the master's route, which I think can be valuable, definitely isn't needed for everyone. Uh, it's always worth looking at different ways to subsidize those things. And I like what you're doing where you're working full time and also doing this program. Uh, a lot of people say, Ken, you know, should I work as a data analyst? Or should I go get this master's degree and, and forgo that for the, the, a certain period of time? Um, and my answer is almost like, why would you, why would you forgo income, like a good income for, for a degree where when you get out, they're going to be asking you what work experience you had, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's a really important component of, of your decision here, which, which makes a ton of sense to me. And it all really flows together nicely, right? It's you're, you're working at, for the UVA football team, you're doing a program at the school, and what you're studying is intimately intertwined with your work. It all like intuitively, logically flows together very nicely. What I would like to see, and this is completely unsolicited uh, like brainstorming, but you know, some partnership with like the UVA uh, football team and the data science program where you do like a hackathon every year uh, or something like that. I think those would be really fun ways to give students experience, but also potentially help you guys out. Like I love the big data bowl. There's a, uh, the big data cup for hockey. Now there's an NBA hackathon. You know, I, I, I see UVA and you guys being able to really do some progressive stuff like that, that, that creates a ton of, of kind of broad benefit. I'd be happy to potentially be a sponsor. So. Okay, well, I'll keep that in mind because so we do have a few things that are going on right now. Um, you know, the university is starting a sports science institute, which is it's a collection of cross department people, so professors from stats and kinesiology and um, athletic trainers and coaches and myself and other people that are looking to kind of, you know, build this from the ground up. And there are, you know, a few different things that are being emphasized right now with that. Um, the statistics department has just started a sports analytics and statistics laboratory. Um, I've met with a few uh, professors and decision makers in the data science program that are starting to have a, it's still even unclear. It's, it's so new about what exactly it is, what the focus is gonna be. Um, but I did mention on the Slack setting up a sports hackathon. So I did this before you even mentioned it. But now I, that you I said figured, you're a sponsor, you can't back out. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't. But, uh, but I, I agree. I think that uh, 
I mean, there are just so many opportunities at a university like this. Great students that want to be involved and want to get experience as, you know, part of their undergraduate experience. So, yeah, future's bright here for sure. I'm looking forward to it. So that's really all the questions I had. Usually at the end, I leave the floor open to you to talk about um, any, any tips that you have for people getting in, any thoughts that you have. If you want to just talk uh, and uh, and uh, hype up UVA football for for a minute or two, that's also fine. Whatever whatever is on uh, front of mind. Okay, let's hype up UVA football. I like that. We've you know talked a little bit about those other things, um, but no, I think that UVA is a great school. This is going to turn into a quick plug. Um, you you went there, so you get it. Yeah, I don't know. I do, I do UVA guys. Uh, but I think that, yeah, it's a really lucky to be at this place with, you know, great leadership that values analytics and values what I do and has such great undergrad students and graduate students and, um, you know, Charlottesville is an, an amazing town. It's just a really great place that we get to live and, you know, be and work and everything that's happening here. And I think that analytics in whether it's college football or other sports, I, I think that it's going to start really taking off um, for more opportunities, not just at UVA, but at other schools. And so I think for those people that are wanting to get into analytics um, with a sports team, I think that there are going to be opportunities, you know, pretty quickly, narrowly down the road and, so hopefully, you know, it won't just be UVA that has these awesome, you know, sports analytics labs and sports science institutes and things like that, but it'll be, you know, every school is, is kind of building that into decision-making and, and giving people an opportunity to get experience in it. Well, hopefully UVA has the first mover advantage. Well, the, the top, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously we'll be the top in the first, but hopefully everybody at some point. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming in chatting with me, Matt. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to air this and uh, I, good luck on the, on the upcoming season. All right. Thanks. Wahoo. Wahoo. Wahoo.